I want to talk to you today about city data, and this is really following on from um, the really fascinating views that Lucia showed yesterday about city data on a personal level. I want to talk about it at, at the enterprise level, as it were, and I think there's a good reason for that. So talking at a conference like this, we've, we've kind of come to the conclusion that using data really well in large organizations is almost business as usual for big commercial enterprises. However, in cities, which millions of people live in and which can affect millions of lives, the use of data is, is really nascent. It's a very new thing, and they are not data-driven entities yet. And I think they could be, and I think that's going to be a very interesting area for our industry to go into in the next few years, which could um, both be a very successful business, but also affect millions of lives. And I think that's a very important thing to think about. So here's where I show you some big numbers to convince you this is genuinely an important thing. Um, so half of us now live in cities in the world. And by 2050, uh, that's estimated to go up to about three quarters of us. So most people are going to live in cities uh, in the very near future. Now that means that cities are very important entities. Um, they are nexuses where lots of people are going to be. So if you want to have impact on a very large number of people, they're, they're places where those people are concentrated. They're also going to become much more brittle. So as you pile more and more people into cities, as resources become more constrained, um, the infrastructure of those cities is going to have to be much, much more data-driven to be able to survive this influx and to be able to allow us all to keep living good lives and the lives that we want to. So that's why city data is going to become a very important topic in the near future. And there are a few things about city data that are kind of the same as in the regular commercial context. So a few things that certainly I think are truisms um, of our industry. A lot of the good technology is open source. So, um, you know, ven vendors aside, but the most of the generic things that you need to do big data well are open source tools. So we've, we've got those tools available for free to start with. Also, our attitude to data has become much more experimental. So where we used to be um, know what we were going to do to start with with data, we, we do a lot more now where we just sort of see what comes up. We think about the problems in a space. We see what data we've got and try and bring those together in an experimental way. And the fact that the technology is cheap and that we have um, very powerful, very scalable technologies available now allows us to be experimental at a much lower cost than used to be. So that opens up new opportunities both in business and in city contexts. Also, the, the architecture is generally quite flipped around now. So we heard about data lakes earlier as an example. Um, rather than having quite a rigid architecture and a, a data warehousing paradigm where we know what the schema is and we try and clean the data and keep it in the schema, instead we tr try and have um, data as raw material and make schemas as late binding as humanly possible so that we repurpose data in lots of different ways with lots of different schemas. And th these are common things, right? These are common across the commercial context. They're common also, I think, in the city context. However, there are some important things that are actually quite different, and, and these are the ones that are really more important to think about. And one of the most important ones is that data gives us insights and gives us power. And in a civic situation or in a city situation where that power is very directly over human lives, this is an important thing to think about, right? So um, that power can be used in very useful ways. Um, it can also be used in other ways. And, uh, to give you an example of one of the things I think is useful um, is something that we work on right now which, with an organization in the UK called Energy Savings Trust. Um, they need to make buildings much more energy efficient. They need to figure out how to do that in a way that scales to city and to nation level. Um, one of the problems with energy efficient buildings is that nobody really knows how buildings actually work in practice a lot of the time. So there's a physics model of how it should work. The reality is totally different. Um, by using sensors to collect much more fine-grained data, we can gain much more insight into what types of buildings work for what kinds of people. So therefore, how do you optimize energy use across a very large scale, so across millions and millions of buildings? That is, in my view, a positive and useful use of data. However, collecting lots of data, particularly when it relates to people, can easily be flipped around uh, and used in more negative ways. So, um, a lot of you probably saw this example when it came out recently. Um, it was actually a spoof, but could, could technically absolutely be true. Um, at a recent conference, uh, some of the researchers put up signs saying they were running the Quantified Toilets Initiative, tracking everybody's visits to the toilets, uh, the contents of what was left in the toilets, and using that for public health. So, okay, well, public health is a very good thing. However, being tracked every time you go to the loo in a public building, 
not so great, I'd say. And it's easy to see how that, that power could edge into controlling people more and more. And I'm not the first person to notice this. Um, time for a little bit of philosophy. Um, there's a guy called Jeremy Bentham, who a lot of you have heard of, who noticed this um, centuries ago almost. Um, and he, he had this concept of the panopticon, uh, which you've probably heard, heard the term before. Um, the idea of the panopticon was a building where one observer at the center can see all the other people in that building. So it's, it's kind of a prison model, although it was used for lots of institutional buildings as an idea. Um, this is the panopticon. Uh, one of the things that people have noted about a panopticon architecture is that uh, the people who are being observed never know if they're being observed, and they actually start to change their behavior as a result. So because someone in principle could have power over them or could observe what they're doing, that changes the behavior of individuals and constrains their behavior. Um, in my view, that would be a very negative way for our world to go. So I want to find ways for us to get those positive benefits of having data and using data well without the panopticon version of it, which I think would be a, a very bad thing for all of us. Another thing that's quite different about city data is in the real physical world, uh, the risks and the rewards are different and are actually higher. So um, you don't want to move fast and break things if the things you are breaking are are people and are really expensive objects, right? So breaking a website, okay, you do it and you can make changes very easily. If you are doing a traffic model and you make cars crash into one another, that is a lot harder to undo. So as an industry, we need to start thinking quite differently about how we test and implement uses of data in a, in a physical world where things have much more consequence. And that can be, again, a very positive thing, um, certainly for someone building a business. If you're dealing with very expensive objects, then do something useful with those objects. You can make lots of money. Um, so there, there are two sides to this coin again, but I think it's a very important difference from the straightforward commercial or web context to think about. Finally, and I think this is really the big one, which is stopping city data yet becoming a, a really functioning and effective thing is that there is no single owner of a city, right? So it's a much more complex environment than a regular business. In a normal business, you need to make money. You ideally want to make as much money as possible. Your aims are reasonably straightforward, and you own your own systems. In a city, well, there's a city government. Um, they, in principle, own the city to some extent, or they've been empowered to run some things. But they only own some of the physical infrastructure, um, also bits of infrastructure owned by other people. Also, there are lots of private and public bodies that all have a say and all need to come together to make a city really that affecting, effective machine that's the sort of smart city vision that, that gets, uh, gets talked about a lot. And this makes things really complex because, again, politics and civic benefits come into play. Um, the business models are really unclear. So who's supposed to pay for life in cities to be better? Is it the government? Uh, we don't really know. It's not necessarily completely their task. They don't necessarily have the money. Um, but the alternate vision of um, things being made better by privatizing everything also sounds very undesirable. So that there's a lot of um, structural stuff to work through to make a re really, truly data-driven city um, a reality. So um, it's been a very rapid tour of some, some upsides and some downsides of thinking about cities and data. Um, I want to conclude by just saying I do think that using data better in cities and having truly data-driven physical worlds could be a really, really positive thing for all of us. And, and certainly I would um, like to see all the people in this room, if we have this conversation again in five years, being involved in it and actually building the type of data-driven city that we all want to see and all want to live in. And I think that actually is a very exciting prospect. Thank you very much.